Welcome to Lesson 14b, Aerodynamic Drag on Various Objects. In this lesson, I'll show you some tables of drag coefficient for various objects. Then I'll do a student-friendly example problem, drag on a bicycle. You can find drag coefficients in various tables, in books and on the internet. In our textbook, Table 11.1 is for 2D bodies, and Table 11.2 is for 3D bodies. I'll show both and make a few comments. First of all, the two-dimensional bodies. In other words, this body is two-dimensional into the page. So the frontal area is A equal BD, where B is the length into the page. To be considered a 2D body, B should be much greater than D. Notice how a little bit of streamlining, just rounding these corners, reduces the drag coefficient by almost a factor of 2. If we have a rectangular rod rather than a square rod, the drag coefficient depends on the ratio of L over D. When L over D is 0, this is a thin plate aligned perpendicular to the flow. Notice that as we increase L over D, CD goes up, reaches a max, and then goes back down. Rounding the leading edge reduces CD significantly for all values of L over D. For a round cylinder, the drag coefficient is smaller when the boundary layer is turbulent compared to laminar. We'll discuss cylinders and spheres in a later lesson. For elliptical rods, again, CD depends on L over D. CD keeps decreasing for either the laminar or the turbulent case as L over D increases. Here are some other geometric shapes like triangles. The drag coefficient is lower when the point of the triangle is aligned into the flow. It's still pretty high because of flow separation around these sharp edges. But in this flow, the flow separation is right at the leading edge, and the drag coefficient is not surprisingly higher. We see a similar effect for a semicircular shell, where this case is more streamlined than this case. This case has a very high CD because the fluid gets trapped inside this shell. If it's a rod rather than a shell, we have similar behavior as we had here. Now let's look at 3D bodies, a cube, thin circular disk, a cone, a sphere, an ellipsoid. We'll talk in more detail about spheres in a later lesson. The behavior is similar to that of cylinders. Most of these drag coefficients for blunt bodies like this are close to 1. We also give CD for hemispheres, stubby cylinders, aligned vertically as well as horizontally, a streamlined body like a torpedo, a rectangular plate. Here we have an empirical equation that depends on L over D. Unlike most bodies, where we want a small drag coefficient, a parachute is designed to have a large drag coefficient. If you turn this hemisphere 90 degrees, we see that we have about the same drag coefficient. When there are hurricanes or tornadoes, a tree's survival will depend on its drag coefficient. Notice that it decreases with speed. That's because the leaves and small branches bend into the wind, lowering the drag coefficient. But since drag goes up like V squared, the drag force on a tree keeps increasing with speed, even though the drag coefficient is decreasing. Finally, we show some more fun objects like a person. There's a big difference between drag area, standing, or sitting. For bicycles, assuming the racing position can greatly decrease both the frontal area and the drag coefficient, and therefore the drag area. When two bicycles are drafting, the second one has a much lower drag coefficient than the first one. A well-designed fairing can decrease the drag coefficient significantly. The same thing is true for trucks. Now it's rare to find a truck without a fairing. We've already talked about automobiles in a previous lesson. Buildings are typically pretty boxy, so it's not surprising that CD is around 1 or greater, depending on the shape. Now let's do an example problem. It turns out that coasting a bicycle down a long hill enables us to measure the drag area of the bike and rider combination. In this problem, we give the mass of the bike and the rider and the rolling resistance of the tires. And while coasting, in other words, no pedaling, the terminal speed is 10.1 meters per second, where terminal speed is defined as the constant speed while coasting down the hill. We'll talk about terminal speed again in later lessons. In part A, we want to calculate the drag area, CDA of the bicycle rider combination. So the first thing we do is draw a free body diagram. We have a weight downward. We have a normal force, 
normal to this sloped road. We have an aerodynamic drag, and we have a rolling resistance drag. Both of these are parallel to V. We're ignoring any lift force, which should be negligibly small. Let's split up the weight into two components. The component in the direction of travel is mg sine theta, and the component in the negative normal direction is mg cosine theta. Since there's no acceleration in this problem, Newton's second law tells us that sigma f equals zero. Let's let coordinate x be in the direction of travel, and we'll let y be normal to x. So Newton's equation splits up into sigma fx equals zero and sigma fy equals zero. The x component has forces mg sine theta minus fd rolling minus fd arrow. So you can see that my sketch is certainly not to scale. This component of the weight has to balance these two forces. We rewrite this by plugging in our equation for fd aerodynamic. This is what we want to calculate, the drag area. Solving for CDA, we get our answer in variable form. We plug in the values, the total mass, rider plus bicycle, g, a unity conversion factor to get this term into newtons, times sine 5 degrees, minus the rolling resistance, divided by 1 half rho, times the terminal speed squared, and we need the same unity conversion factor. We get 0 0.762 square meters. And this is our answer for part A. For part B, we're asked to calculate how much power to the wheel it would take for the person to ride this bike on a level road at the same speed. Just like cars, bicycles have a rolling resistance drag and an aerodynamic drag. So we can use the same power equation we had in a previous lesson for automobiles, where mu rolling times w is the rolling resistance force, which we'll approximate as the same as in part A. Drag area is a constant that does not change with speed. Plugging in the numbers, we have rolling resistance times speed v plus one half rho v cubed and our CDA from part A, where I've used a few more digits to avoid round off error. Our unity conversion factor and another one to get watts. We get 665 watts. For those of you who like English units, this is about 0.89 horsepower. Most people can't even produce this much power. But some racing riders may be able to do it for a short time. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.